Hi, this is Lawrence Reed, President Emeritus of the Foundation for Economic Education. I am pleased today, February 19, 2024, to interview an old friend of mine, DeRoy Murdoch, right here at FEES headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. DeRoy is much more than just a friend of nearly 30 years. He's a lover of liberty and a media celebrity who appears regularly on television as a Fox News contributor. He's a prolific writer as well. His commentary is published every week in such major outlets as the New York Post, Daily Caller, and the American Spectator. He earned his bachelor's degree in government from Georgetown University in 1986 and his MBA in marketing and international business from New York University in 1989. In 1995, DeRoy and I, along with a small group of like-minded folks, visited think tanks in four Latin American countries, Chile, Argentina, Peru, and Colombia. That's when I first met you, DeRoy. Sure. Welcome to Fee. It's great to see you again. Larry, it's great to see you. Wonderful to be with you again. Thank you so much for, for coming here. I know you spoke today at Emory University here in town. Well, uh, looking at your background, DeRoy, I immediately noticed a bachelor's degree in government. <laughs> uh, I remember that for the first semester of my freshman year at college, uh, I majored in something quite similar, political science. But I quickly surmised that if it's politics, it ain't science. It's usually just A, robbing B to give to C, and then reminding C to vote for A's reelection. Did they teach you that at Georgetown? Uh, I think I sort of picked that up along the way. I'm not sure they taught it in exactly those terms. I, I wish I'd studied, a, got a degree in limited government, but it's just government there, <laughs> which is pretty much the same as political science anywhere else. I, I guess Georgetown considers it the art of government versus the science of politics. <laughs> well, it's hard for me to believe it's been 30 years. It will be 30 years next January, 25, uh, since uh, you and I and some friends stopped in Buenos Aires, Argentina, on our Latin American tour. And uh, it's funny the things you remember. I re recall that at, on that trip you told me uh, to see this movie, The Madness of King George. Well, it became one of my all-time favorites, and I'll bet I've seen it 20 times since. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. A lot has happened in Argentina uh, since our visit uh, so long ago. Most recently, the stunning election of a libertar libertarian, Javier Malay, as president. And I'm wondering, uh, Deroy, what are your thoughts on his victory and his prospects uh, for success? I was very happy to see him win. Uh, I call him uh, El con el pelo, the guy with the hair. <laughs> yeah. The guy with the wild hair. It's really quite, it. quite a signature element. Uh, and this is great news, and I, I think his victory is probably a, a good example of what happens in a lot of countries, even left-wing countries, where, um, you know, as Margaret Thatcher used to like to say, you know, uh, socialism is wonderful until you run out of other people's money. Yeah. And I think in Argentina, that, that, that's what happened. And people said, look, you know, we, we've tried everything else. Let's just go the other direction and, and have a libertarian president. Uh, you know, one of the great free market success stories on the planet is New Zealand, which pretty much privatized everything. I mean, everything except maybe the national monuments. And it was not done by a free market government. It was done by a socialist government. And they said, look, there's no money left. We have, we have no money to re redistribute. We, can't have, we have nothing to give away. So let's listen to these crazy uh, free market guys and try that. And they did, and the thing blossomed beautifully. So I think uh, Argentina is in a similar situation. And uh, one of the things that makes me sanguine about his prospects is that a lot of people who you and I know, people like Fundación Libertad and a lot of the libertarian think tanks and uh, writers and, uh, and uh, economists and so on have been down there for the last you know, 30, 40 years preaching these ideas. Uh, and you know, I really admire their, their perseverance because for so long it's looked just grim, like, like these yeah. people are just never gonna make it yeah. out of that mess. Uh, but now the good news is you've got a president who is open to these ideas and you've got a whole cadre of people who've got lots and lots of ideas. You know, here's what we should do about agriculture. Here's what we ought to do on electricity. Here's the plan on uh, pensions. Here's what we ought to do about the arts, whatever it might be. And so uh, uh, President Malay can get in touch with uh, uh, Fundacion Libertad or Gerardo Bon Giovanni or any of these other folks and say, look, what do you should gotta do about uh, you know, hydroelectric dams? I'll say, well, funny you should mention that. We have, <laughs> we have a paper on that. Yeah. And so our friends down there, I think, have a great opportunity to take uh, all these ideas they've been thinking about for the last you know, three, four decades and actually uh, have someone who's very eager to implement them and see if they work. And the beauty of, of the Argentine situation is 
if things turn around there, right now they think they've got what an inflation rate of 100 percent or something like that. Uh, I think 200. Is it 200? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Let's say he, uh, let's say the uh, President Malay can bring the uh, inflation rate down to 50 percent. Well, that's going to be a huge victory, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And for uh, sure. if he th uh, turns things around the way we hope he will, he will be a massive, massive uh, counterexample to the uh, Maduro, uh, Hugo Chavez, um, Sandinista, Castro model in Latin America. And people will be able to say, well, look, do you want to live in Venezuela or do you want to live something like the now, I hope, thriving, uh, beautiful, uh, energetic, and vibrant Argentina? And if that happens, that'll be very good for Latin America and frankly, very good for this country. If we can look, we in this country can point to Argentina, how they turn things around through free market methods, uh, then wonderful. This should be a great example for uh, people all, all around the world. Yeah, that, that would be an incredible and exciting op opportunity to uh, show people all over the world that freedom works. Uh, I can't think of a single episode in history where you've had freedom and free markets making a mess of things and the socialists come in to uh, clean up and make things better. I mean, it, it's, it's always in the other direction. It's always in the direction. I, and to be fair and nice to them, I've tried to think of examples like that. And certainly in the U.S., I've thought about, can you think of any uh, you know, market-oriented governor who got beated by a, a big government governor or mayor uh, and things turned out and got better, and I can't think of any examples. Yeah, yeah, I can't either. Well, uh, let's turn uh, to matters here at home. Uh, that's where your commentary most often uh, is focused. You're a first-generation black American. Your parents were born in Costa Rica, and I know that you love America. And so I have to ask you, uh, DeRoy, what is wrong with the narrative frequently peddled by the mainstream media and uh, quite a few prominent self-anointed black leadership that says America is irredeemably racist. It's an awful, sad, and terribly destructive idea, and it's one that we see, uh, it's just like a, a brush fire you just can't seem to put out. Just when you think it calms down, it flares back up again. And uh, you hear this taught most um, energetically by people like Abraham X. Kendi, uh, who's, I guess, sort of the, the godfather of uh, critical race theory. Uh, you've got the 1619 Project saying America's just basically a giant plantation, always has been, and this sort of concept. And it's, it's so self-destructive and so untrue. Uh, it happens to be February now. It's Black History Month. And I always tell people, well, why do we not celebrate people like Madam C.J. Walker, yeah who uh, was an entrepreneur. She came up with black hair care products back about 1905, 1910 or so. Uh, she ended up becoming the, uh, America's first uh, self-made uh, black female, million, uh, female millionaire, uh, maybe black female millionaire for sure, maybe female millionaire in general. Uh, she ended up buying a house, I believe, up in Westchester County next to or very, or very close to Henry Ford. Um, and she became very wealthy, and she didn't do this by, you know, living off the government. She did it by coming up with, with some products, being an entrepreneur, getting a sales force, and getting people to go out and buy her products. She was very successful. Uh, you look at right around that same time, Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong starting something we call jazz, yeah. which is America's greatest uh, uh, domestic sui generis art form. And this was done by successful black artists as well as black producers, also white producers, white club owners, et cetera. It's a great part of the American experience, and this is very positive. Um, I like to look a little forward at, also in music, but further down the road at uh, Barry Gordy up in oh, Detroit. Yeah. Uh, 1958, he borrowed, I think, the equivalent of about 8000 bucks from his family. He started a little something called Motown Records. He's still living, I think, in He's California. still alive. He should be roughly nine, late 80s, 90s or so. He's definitely way up there, but he's still alive, thankfully. And, uh, you know, he brought to us the music of Marvin Gaye and The Temptations and Stevie Wonder uh, and uh, Supremes. Beautiful music. People still listen to this stuff. And this was at a time in 1958 where you still had Jim Crow, you had uh, black people being lynched, you had people with uh, uh, black uh, uh, waiting rooms and you know colored water fountains, all this sort of stuff. I mean, segregation was going on full blast, but this guy in Detroit got the, this idea, hey, let me go start a company, see what happens. He made it, he made a lot of people very wealthy, created beautiful music we still enjoy today. And I think the example of Motown, people turning on the TV and seeing these beautiful, uh, talented, incredibly, uh, elegant uh, artists on Ed Sullivan's show and listening to music, I think unconsciously or subconsciously, that probably said to a lot of white people, you know, these these people are not savages. They're they're decent people. They they deserve their rights. They deserve their freedom, and, and and they got it. So all those positive examples, and yet you listen to the critical race theory people, and it's just oh, white white people holding down black people. We can't make it. We're victims. We're just you know, we might as well just hide under the bed. It's an it's an industry. It's, uh, an it's industry. not a racket. Uh, oh, yeah. I think it's more of a racket than industry. But a lot of people making a lot of money on this. And I'm old enough, so I hear these people and I laugh at them. But if I if I were ten years old. And I heard this stuff, I think, wow, I can't make it. You know, Whitey's going to hold me down. So there's really no point going to school. Yeah. Why bother doing homework? I guess I'll just join a gang. Yeah. 
And you know, unfortunately, some kids listen to that and they're you know, dead by the age of 20. This is terrible. This is, this is pure cancer these people are pushing. It is ugly, nasty, and totally unnecessary, totally untrue, and highly destructive. Yeah, very divisive. You mentioned Barry Gordy and Motown Records. I remember uh, when I was living in Michigan, which I did for 30 years, uh, his home in Detroit, where he started Motown Records, is a museum. It's called Hitsville. And uh, I remember, well, it must go back now 20 or 25 years, but Detroit City Council passed an ordinance. Uh, I don't know if it's still on the books, but they, they passed an ordinance that banned uh, individuals from starting a business in their home, which if that had been on the books when Barry Gordy started Motown Records, he he'd ha would have had to have left because that basically says to everybody, hey, if, if you haven't got the money to buy a building or rent one, but you have a house, too bad, you can't start a business. That's amazing, that's incredible. And, and you think of the businesses that have been started in homes, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, Amazon was started by Jeff Bezos yep. in his home. I think he and his wife started, started off as a little small thing, sell books to their- In Seattle, I think. Seattle, yeah. to their neighbors, and I think that did okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Steve Jobs started Apple in his garage. I believe uh, Mr. Hewlett, Mr. Packard started Hewlett Packard in Silicon Valley in their garage. So you think of all the big companies that are now multi-billion dollar multinationals who were started literally in people's homes. Yeah. Now, if you say, look, we're gonna open up a slaughterhouse, we're gonna bring pigs in and, you know, <laughs> the neighbors are hearing the sound of pigs being slaughtered at three in the morning, you know, maybe that takes it a little bit far, but my God, if, you, if you've got a, a business that is not, uh, you know, spreading pollution and, and noise and chaos, you ought to be able to do that. Yeah, I'll bet nobody complained in that neighborhood when Barry Gordy uh, was, uh, hosting uh, up-and-coming musicians and they were playing music, I, I would have shown up myself just to listen. That's something we economists call, uh, or I'm not really an economist, but something economists call uh, positive externality. Yep, yep. exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, I take it, uh, Deroy, that as a black American with the views that you have, that you probably have some rather unequivocal uh, views about reparations. Uh, that's an issue right now that... Uh, uh, some people are talking about reparations for historically oppressed minority communities. What are your thoughts on that issue? Yeah, uh, I've uh, spoken and written a lot about this. I think it's a dumb and dangerous idea. And, uh, you know, we seem in this society to be really focused on uh, everything that happened in the 1800s and the 1700s and 1600s and not really focused on what are we going to do about the 2020s and 2030s. I mean, we ought to be looking forward for one thing. Secondly, if we are going to have a slavery reparations project, in this country, uh, who do we compensate? You know, we have a lot of people of mixed background. A uh, great example would be, would be President Obama, okay? Half black, half white. Um, now, does he get a check? He was President of the United States, so he did okay. So does he get quite as much money as if he were somebody who maybe uh, had a blue collar job? Um, his daughters literally were raised in the White House, okay? So does that mean they're still oppressed and they get money as well? Um, you've got black folks like uh, like me and others who are black, but we're, our families are from the Caribbean or, or directly from Africa, or, you know, arriving within the last 10, 20, 30 years. Um, we're really not part of the American slavery experience in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. So do we get money? Uh, and the people who pay into the, in, into the money, now, pay into the system, if you could find the, the, a living slave owner and a living slave, I'd say get the living slave owner to give some money to the living slave. Uh, those people are all long gone. Yeah. So, um, do you go after the uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren of somebody who might have owned a plantation? And what if you're white, blonde hair, blue-eyed, but your great-grandpa uh, died at uh, Gettysburg trying to end slavery? Does your family still owe money to people even though great-grandpa you know, ended up face down in, in the dirt at age uh, you know, 23, 24, uh, fighting for the Union? So I think this is just a total mess. Uh, and rather than tear our, our country to pieces over uh, slavery that ended in 1865, what is that, 160 years ago almost? Um, why don't we focus on positive things like um, school choice? Yeah. Uh, I'm all for anything we could do to increase school choice options for poor uh, black kids and poor kids of all backgrounds. Um, I think you'll get a lot more done if you focus on how can we help uh, little poor black, white, black girls and black boys do well in school and get them focused on that. Um, you know, you look at a situation like Chicago where I think there's something in the neighborhood of a couple dozen schools where kids are, there's literally not one, I don't mean one percent, I mean zero, not one little girl, not one little boy proficient in math or reading, not one. And that's a, over, throughout an entire school. I think you have a couple, couple dozen schools like that, okay? Um, 
if we can get that fixed and turned around and that's up and running, and so kids in Chicago, for example, actually learning something, maybe then we could have a discussion about uh, slavery reparations. I think it's way too premature to do that. Let's focus on those other emergencies we have right now rather than uh, uh, dredge up the, uh, the bones of uh, people 160 years old. But a lot of the people who seem to champion reparations seem utterly uninterested in the plight of uh, children who are trapped in failing government schools in our inner, inner cities. I think there's a lot of truth to that. You don't hear people, again, like Ibrahim X. Kendi, like uh, uh, Robin D'Angelo, who wrote White Fragility. Um, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, I think, is the woman who runs the 1619 yes. Project, right? Uh, first of all, you don't hear them talk very much about what can we do about little kids and failing schools. That, that doesn't seem to be on their agenda. Their agenda seems to be get whitey. That's what they're focused on, number one. Number two, and, and maybe even more fundamentally, um, these are the same people who keep telling you, oh, you're black, you're not going to make it. A you know, white man's going to hold you down. You're a victim. You're not going to make it. Well, then how on earth, if you can't make it, how do they get PhDs? Yeah. These people are telling you, oh, you know, you're not going to, it's a failure. It's, you're never going to make it in America. And yet they've got PhDs. They've got, uh, t- uh, they've got uh, tenure in universities. They've got book contracts. A lot of them have speaking deals. Uh, if you're a guy like Ibrahim X. Kendi, I think he got some kind of, a, I think it's $25, $30 million grant to start this uh, center for diversity and, and inclusion or whatever, I think at Boston University, if I'm not, not wrong. Oh, he's, he's so severely oppressed. Yeah, he's so oppressed, <laughs> somebody wrote him a check for 30 million, and then it turns out he apparently really squandered the money. They, they didn't have very much results for all this cash they had, and now people are upset at him. But, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if Whitey's holding you down as a black man, you know, if that comes with a $30 million check, you know, I, I'm ready to be held down. I was always taught, and I'm sure you were too, <clears throat> in schools and uh, at home, that a person ought to be judged by, as Dr. King put it, the content of his character, not the color of his skin. Uh, We were to look forward to the day when all of us were truly colorblind. And we made a lot of progress in that direction in recent decades, but it seems in more recent years that the left is obsessed with skin color. What, What explains that and can we ever get back on track? Yeah, the left just, they cannot seem to let go of this. It's almost like a, like a rattler, like a little, looking at a kid with a rattler who's just shaking the rattler and trying to take the rattler away and the, ra- the kid starts screaming and yelling and, you know, turning colors. Uh, and they just, they can't seem to accept the idea that we are making any kind of progress. I mean, whether you agree or disagree with, with uh, Barack Obama, he was president of the United States for eight years. And he won, uh, he didn't win squeaking by. He, he won very comfortably beating John McCain in 08 and then very comfortably beating Mitt Romney in 2012. So he was elected and reelected comfortably. And a lot of people, I think, thought, this is great. We have our first black president. This is a great step forward. We're really making progress as a country. And uh, you talk to the critical race theory people now, and they never talk about that. Yeah. And it just sounds, you know, the way, if you hear, hear them talk, it's like, you know, Jim Crow's right around, the, right around the corner and he's putting his boots on and he's coming for you. So, <laughs> so, you know, get in line and do as we tell you. And they don't like to talk about things like uh, the Obama presidency. They don't like to talk about the fact that we've had uh, two consecutive uh, black uh, secretaries of state, uh, Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. We had two consecutive black uh, attorneys general, Eric Holder and uh, Loretta Lynch. Um, they don't like to hear about the fact that the American Express had a black CEO named Ken Chenault for about 25 years. Uh, we have a man in New York City named uh, Richard Parsons. He was the CEO of, uh, of Time Warner and Citigroup, arguably our largest bank and arguably our largest media company, both run by a black man. Uh, I think at the moment, the CEO of, of uh, Merck is a, a black gentleman whose name I don't remember at the moment, I'm afraid. Uh, and then my favorite story along these lines was a man named E. Stanley O'Neill, who I believe he's still around as far as I know. Uh, e. Stanley O'Neill's uh, father, I believe, was either a sharecropper or a chauffeur. And his grandfather was a slave. Mm. E. Stanley O'Neill was the chairman and CEO of Merrill Lynch. The O'Neill family went from slavery to the chairmanship of Merrill Lynch in two generations. Wow. Okay, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that we, we have a thousand such examples. That's a, a pretty unusual case, but that can happen in America, and it did happen in America. And rather than celebrate that and say, this is great, let's have more East Stanley O'Neills. All you will hear about is slavery and Jim Crow, I just was driving on the drive over here. There's a woman talking about very sad experiences she had in the civil rights movement, getting beaten up by by white, uh, you know, white uh, cops and white, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, various authorities and so on at the lunch counters. And I don't deny that happened, but just the today on the drive over, maybe half an hour ago, she was going through that whole terrible experience. And I don't deny her that experience. That doesn't mean we shouldn't learn from those experiences and talk about them. But it seems like that's all we talk about. We don't talk about black success. We don't talk about these wonderful examples. And again, say to little eight, nine, and 10 year old black kids, look, you know, East Stanley O'Neill went from slavery to running Merrill Lynch in two generations. You can do that too. So sit down, do your homework, Stop goofing off and get yourself prepared for success in America. I don't hear that coming from that crowd at all. Yeah, yeah. I know you've made a distinction between color blindness and color neutrality. Maybe you could explain that for our listeners. Yeah, I've, I've heard a, a bit, little bit of pushback on the, on the part of some people on the left to hear the term colorblind. That's impossible. You can't be colorblind. And I think there's some truth to that. I, I, I think it's asking too much for us ever to expect that. Uh, anybody of any color look at somebody else and not notice, oh, that person's black, that person's white, that person's Asian. Um, that really is probably um, too much to ask. I don't think it's too much to ask that we be color neutral and say, okay, I notice that person is black or white or Hispanic or Asian, whatever it is, but that doesn't matter to me. That's okay. Any more than if you see somebody's left-handed. I don't think you're gonna say, oh, that person's left-handed, I'm not gonna hire him. Or, I don't wanna talk to that person, he's left-handed. Or she's left-handed, get her out of here right now. I, I don't think you'd see that. Yeah. So if, at some point, if we get to the point where people look at skin color as, as right-handed versus left-handed and put about as much moral weight into that, uh, I think that would be a big step forward. Uh, and certainly where we can expect color blindness to, to whatever degree that can be achieved, it should be the same kind of blindness we expect in the justice system. Uh, if you're dealing with the government, the government is going to treat you the same whether you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian background, or whatever else, and shouldn't be putting putting the, the, the thumb down on the scale, or for that matter, their feet or the boots or whatever it is on the scale to give you either disadvantage or advantage based on your race. That's what the whole civil rights movement was about here in Atlanta, where we're sitting now, where Dr. King lived and did his, his magnificent work. Uh, that was what that's all about, and we achieved those things, and now it seems like we're going the other direction and trying to focus again on people's skin color, which... I thought the whole idea was to get get away from that, which yeah. we did, and now we're we seem to be racing back in the opposite direction, which is really terrible. Uh, there seems to be a lot of people these days uh, who profess to be speaking on behalf of this or that community. I speak for the black community. I speak for the, the you know, fill in the blank, um, uh, oppressed minority or whatever. And uh, the media often uh, shows that it's got its favorites among such people. And I'm wondering, um, why does an Al Sharpton, uh, often portrayed as a spokesperson for the black community, why does he carry more clout and command more attention than, say, a, a brilliant black economist like Thomas Sowell? Sure. Well, what you, what you say reminds me of a wonderful r remarks from the late great P.J. O'Rourke, who once said, "I don't know. Uh, I don't know what's good for you. You don't know what's good, what's good for me. And together, we don't know what's good for the American people." <laughs> and, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of people in the media will look at somebody like Al Sharpton and think, "Oh, Al Sharpton knows what's good for." Uh, black community, let's go talk to him. I uh, used to be Jesse Jackson, but he's gotten, I guess, a little bit old old uh, uh, up in the years. Uh, but I, uh, part of it, I think, is that people like a guy like Al Sharpton because he's on the left, and they tend to be on the left, so they agree with what he has to say. Uh, they probably don't agree very much, very much with what uh, Thomas Sowell has to say, or Ben Carson, perhaps, or maybe um, Brian uh, Donalds, of, uh, of a congressman from Florida, for example, who's very, very well-spoken. Uh, they don't really like to hear what those guys have to say, which is, limited government, let's use free enterprise to get ahead, let's rely less on government programs and, and racial preferences and all that. So they run to a guy like Al Sharpton because he says what they want to hear, yeah. which is spend a lot of money, get the government involved, uh, focus on racism and not advancement and success, that kind of thing. So he pretty much tells them what they want to hear, which is why they track him down and ask him to say it. And uh, dutifully, he does. He's also very, very good. I'll give him credit for this. Very good at seeing a controversy and, and, and swooping in like a member of the uh, paratroopers or something and just landing there with his with the cameras and everything ready to go to take any sort of a situation, exploit it, and, and, and gin up uh, uh, racial uh, chaos. I, I'm guessing, though, that if, if Al Sharpton uh, came out one day and said, I'm in favor of school choice and I oppose the minimum wage, uh, they would drop him like a hot potato. Yeah, I think they'd, they'd pull his name out of uh, their Rolodexes or whatever passes for Rolodexes these days. <laughs> exactly Goodbye, right. Al. Bye-bye, Al. Nice to know you. <laughs> Have a good life. <laughs> As you know, uh, DeRoy, because you've been acquainted with Fee for a long time, uh, we strive to communicate the principles of freedom and free markets, and we do that to people of all colors all over the world. But that's a bigger challenge sometimes and in some places uh, than in other places. So I'm wondering what advice would you give for reaching the black community with this message? 
Well, I think uh, it's very important to focus on a number of things. One is uh, human stories. Uh, you know, a lot of us in the free market movement like to look at graphs and charts and spreadsheets and this sort of thing, and they certainly have their place. But, you know, I think talking about actual human beings and what they've, uh, the challenges they've faced, how they've overcome those challenges and how they've prospered, those are all very positive things. And, uh, you know, people might, I think people tend to be moved by that, those sorts of things. I think a lot of people just don't, don't remember, because they've not been taught this sort of thing. They don't remember examples like very much uh, Booker, Booker T. Washington being born a slave. Uh, if you've read his amazing, amazing book, Up From Slavery, he spent a good part of the time living under a house. He thought, well, uh, no one will hurt me here. So he, uh, he lived under the crawl space under a house for a while. <laughs> He'd go to work and they'd crawl under the house. That's where he lived, on top of the dirt and eventually was able to save enough money to get a room and actually sleep in a bed. And before long, the guy was uh, uh, writing books, uh, founded Tuskegee University, uh, running an entire entire university, and then hopping on, and it wasn't planes back then, hopping on trains and giving lectures around the country. Uh, he eventually and famously had uh, was invited to dinner at the White House by Teddy Roosevelt, President Teddy Roosevelt, first black man to be at the White House, uh, being served food rather than serving food to others. Uh, and uh, this is a guy, again, started off his life as a, as a, as a little boy, as a slave, and within, what, 40, 40, 40-ish years, he's having dinner at the White House as a guest of the President of the United States. You know, that's just one example of many others, and I think f- focusing on that as real people rather than just a theoretical concept of, yeah, you can make it. Uh, we need to hear more of that. We just don't hear enough of that sort of thing anymore. Yeah, you know, when I was growing up, uh, all of us kids had to know who Booker T. Washington was, but I don't think that's the case today. I think we don't teach about him anymore. We really don't, not much. Uh, and you know, so much of this stuff, we're talking about books and lectures and so on, a lot of this stuff is extremely cinematically rich. I don't think there's been a Booker T. Washington movie as far as I know. Uh, a movie called Up From Slavery, just tell the Booker T. Sto- uh, Booker oh T. Gosh, Washington story yeah. from when he's a little boy uh, until you know you can end it when he's running university, maybe it ends with him having dinner with Teddy Roosevelt, whatever it is, and uh, you know, get some actors and put it on, on screen. I will say there was a very good, I think Netflix or Amazon, one or the other, did a, I think a three-part uh, miniseries on Madam C.J. Walker, uh, okay. uh, which was very good. And uh, I believe Octavia Spencer played her, if I'm not mistaken. She's an Academy Award winning oh, yeah. uh, actress. She's fantastic. And that's a great movie. And that's great. So more of that sort of thing. Let's see more of that. Um, I saw and enjoyed the uh, updated, uh, I don't want to say sequel. It's not exactly a sequel to The Color Purple, but it's a, it's a new musical version. Uh, I think it's basically the film version of the musical that was based on the original movie by Steven Spielberg. And that's... Um, Fictional, there's, it's not a true story, but I mean, it's an inter- interesting story about a, a black woman trying to overcome a, a lot of things, mainly you know, being oppressed by terrible black men, among other things. <laughs> and but you do see, among other things, other things, there's a, a big um, one of the one of the uh, supporting uh, actresses, uh, Taraji uh, Henson, I think is her name, if I'm getting that right. Uh, she's wonderful in the in the film. She plays a uh, sort of a Oh, sort of a Bessie Smith, I guess, maybe type blues singer. And she's very successful. She comes out and sings a couple of very raunchy songs and drives around in this beautiful, you know, uh, gorgeous, elegant car from the 1930s. And um, anyway, that's a great performance. And it, it gives you a little bit of a glimpse on, on how life was, at least that fictionalized situation, with some very poor black people and also some who were succeeding as well. Well, I'm so glad to know that there is a movie about Madam C.J. Walker. I, I don't think I've seen it. But I remember in doing some research on her that at one time she had something like 10,000 saleswomen working for her, selling her hair care products throughout the Caribbean and in much of the U.S. She did. Oh, sort of like, you know, precursor for Avon and that kind of thing. And she was the first black millionaires Mm -hmm. uh, who earned her money not from an inheritance or any special privilege or a husband but she did it on her own. Did her what own, an yeah. amazing story. There ought to be many movies about her. There should be a lot. And by the way, you know, I think a great uh, example of black success, also a great example of female success. Mm-hmm. And there's no reason feminists shouldn't embrace Madam C.J. Walker yeah. as much as black people should. Uh, another movie along, or touch this on, on the topic of films, uh, Octavia Spencer, I think, is in this movie, and I think uh, Taran G. Henson is as well. A wonderful movie called uh, Hidden Figures. Oh, oh which about is the code breakers, a, right? Yeah, the, this is yeah. about uh, some women who work for, true, very true story about women who work for NASA back in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, I think on the Gemini uh, moonshots, or not moonshots, Gemini. Oh, uh, circling, okay, that's circling, different, or, not, not yeah, code breaking then. Not okay. code breaking, but uh-huh. uh, doing very, very heavy math, uh-huh. heavy, very extremely heavy duty math that NASA used to figure out you know, exactly how much rocket fuel at what speed with what trajectory would get John Glenn up in outer space and more importantly, bring him safely home. Uh-huh. 
and they relied on these these brilliant black women to sit down and do these elaborate calculations, not with any computers, mm -hmm. early on computers with the computer punch cards. But a lot of this this was just doing stuff on chalkboards and, and writing down math equations on paper. And they'd say, all right, what's the exact launch code device? You know, what what, what angle is it? You know, 3.8 degrees or 3.9 <laughs> degrees? The answer is 3.756 degrees, sir. You know, whatever. It is. Oh my gosh! And uh, and this is how they got the astronauts up in the up in space and back. And again, this is a, a that movie is a direct refutation for some of the critical race theory people who say that uh, math is really for white people. Yeah. That it's not a black thing. It's it's pretty much a you know, white man's project. And uh, that's a a disgusting racist comment. Yeah. And b just watch the movie uh, Hidden Figures and you'll see a bunch of black women, true story, who knew their math and they got astronauts up into space and brought them safely home. You have a list of topics on which you give speeches all over this country and probably abroad as well. Uh, a list that's as long as my arm. <laughs> uh, one of them I wanted you to uh, comment on or add a little bit uh, from the title here. It's entitled, uh, From Memphis to Motown, How Black and White Musicians and Entrepreneurs Killed Jim Crow. Now most people, uh, just assume that what killed Jim Crow were politicians. But that talk uh, says there's another di a missing dimension in that story. Maybe you could uh, summarize that. No question uh, politicians were involved in killing Jim Crow and, and the, the 64 Civil Rights Act, which is the final dagger in Jim, Jim Crow's back, was a, a federal law passed by Congress. And, and thank God they passed it in 1964 and LBJ signed it. Uh, but I think part of what also helped was uh, what was going on in music at that time. And, in, and I give a speech about this. In Memphis, you had essentially uh, black and white people living in the same city. They had had a, a very large yellow fever outbreak in the late 1800s. The city lost its charter and was evacuated. There's nobody there. And after five, six, seven years, people started drifting back in. And I think because the notion was, look, we have to build this place from scratch. I think a lot of the racist segregation, um, you know, separate water fountains, you stay over there, we'll stay over here kind of thing was softened because these people really need to rely on each other. So they could kind of backpedal that a bit. It wasn't totally gone, but it wasn't all the way cranked up to 15 like it was in places like Birmingham, Alabama. So you had that for starters. So, so the racial mix, mixture was a little easier. And then you had people from white folks coming down from the mountains with bluegrass and country music. You had black folks coming up from Mississippi Delta with blues and gospel. And these people would sit down in nightclubs and, and play music together. And a little bit of the country would mix in with a little bit of the gospel and some of the blues would mix in with the country and all that blended together and you got something called rock and roll. Oh. And uh, that's where rock and roll got started, this, this beautiful fusion of, uh, of these cultural elements coming together. And um, from there you got Elvis Presley, you got Johnny Cash, you got uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, you also got B.B. King who came out of there oh, yeah. and a lot of other wonderful musicians and rock and roll kind of flowed from there. Uh, right about that same time, or a few, couple, three, four years later, you got again started up in Motown with Jerry, with Barry Gordy, and with the Motown experience. And um, uh, his he was a former auto worker, so he basically decided, look, we can uh, turn, we can make a record company that basically works like an auto company. He basically, had an assembly line, you know. In would come rough and tumble kids from the neighbor, neighborhood who had some singing talent, whatnot, maybe from singing in choruses and in church, whatever. And out of the other end came a polished, sophisticated, elegant. Uh, musicians and singers and dancers, uh, people like Marvin Gaye, people like uh, Diana Ross, people like Stevie Wonder, et cetera. And they went on television, they went on Ned Sullivan's show, they went on variety programs and all that. And as I said earlier, I think people across the country saw this th these beautiful, young, elegant people. And rather than thinking, oh, well, these are crazy savages, if we give them their rights, they're gonna tear us to pieces. Yeah. I think the thought was, well, you know, if, if black people are really like what we saw on the Ed Sullivan show the other night, maybe their time has come. And I think that, I don't think consciously that was the intention of Barry Gordy and Motown and these people, but I think as part of the kind of tapestry and what was going on in the background, mm -hmm. if, you, if you want to put it this way, the background music was playing at that time. I think that all those things worked along with what politicians are doing. Yeah. People like Dr. King and a lot of the civil rights uh, demonstrators, I think all those elements blended together uh, to end up in 1964 at the end of Jim Crow and the beginning of uh, true freedom for black people in America. You mentioned B.B. King. I have to say I had the good pleasure of hearing B.B. King. One of his last performances was here in Atlanta in December of 2011. I think he died within a couple of three years thereafter. I think that's about right. But he had uh, his guitar, Lucille, with him, and he sang Lucille, and oh my gosh, it was... Wonderful a magical guy. moment. Yeah, I saw him two or three times. He's a great guy and a big fan of mine. I was very happy to be, be able to see him live on a couple of occasions. 
Well, are you optimistic for America, DeRoy? <laughs> uh, it reminds me of wonderful, one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain, who said, uh, the only thing sadder than a young pessimist is an old optimist. <laughs> it's a great quote. Uh, I'm optimistic about America's potential and potential uh, for American people to do the right thing. What <laughs> brings, brings down the optimism in a number of notches is we always seem to screw it up somehow. I don't know how. So. We, everything everything, everything goes, seems like it's about to go right, and then all of a sudden, boom, something goes, goes wrong, and down we go. Um, I think as long as people focus on, on freedom and prosperity and, and try to make this a, a freer and more um, abundant country, good things can happen. Uh, and if we, we focus on that project, and generally focus on a project of upliftment, how do we, how do we take, take people without and, and, and push them up? That's very positive. That's a very constructive conversation to have. Unfortunately, so much of the conversation isn't about that. It's about how do we get that guy up there in the penthouse and let's get him out of the, drag, the penthouse and drag him down on the sidewalk and show that guy who's in charge and get, you know, get that smile off his nasty face. There's a lot of that sort of thinking, and that's, that's so destructive and so unnecessary. And you know, who cares if the guy up in the penthouse has got you know, one extra yacht, if the people in floors one to 10 are able to pay their bills and put their kids through school and maybe take some vacations and maybe not a big yacht, but maybe have a small fishing boat. Yeah. You know, what's wrong with that? Is that a bad thing? Uh, and so we really ought to, we ought to focus on, on um, overall social and uh, socioeconomic uplift mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, down push, if that's the word. Yeah. And right now, I think there's a lot of focus on, on the latter. You know, how do we sort of, it's almost like a, um, almost a vengeance thing. How do we get even with the rich people and, and you know, show them, put them in their places, as opposed to how do we get these poor people and stop them from being, uh, help them not be poor now, help them be prosperous. That's what we gotta be focused on. And if you're pessimistic about something that hasn't happened yet, you tend to become part of the problem instead of part of the solution. You tend to withdraw, write things off. Uh, you won't rise to the occasion and uh, push your ideas uh, when you know uh, they're right because you think uh, it's time to give up. So I'm glad you're an optimist too. Yeah, that too. Uh, it's very important that people stay engaged. You know, I think a lot of people get dejected. A lot of people feel overwhelmed. Uh, I will give the left this. I, I, I don't like this, but I gotta respect it. These people never go to sleep. They never take a break. They're out there all the time. They're either banging on doors or they're protesting or they're, uh, <laughs> they're applying for grants, they're writing grants, and they're out there all the time. I don't know when these people sleep. I don't know when they, when they eat. Maybe they don't. Uh, and so many people on the right, you know, they're kind of engaged, disengaged, and they're kind of floating in the background, and they want to talk about theory and all that. And, you know, there's a place for theory, and I love theory, certainly, but, uh, you know, we need to be out on the hustings, too, because uh, those people are just absolutely relentless, and we, we need to be equally relentless because, uh, uh, you know, again, they, they just, they don't take any time off. And Something you said just reminded me of, you remember uh, Dick Armey, he's still living, a uh, former Texas congressman. I heard him speak once and he was talking about a conversation he had with uh, Dick Gephardt of Missouri, a, a liberal Democrat. And he said uh, to Gephardt, he said, Dick, you're really good at what you do, it's just that what you do isn't good. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, about right. I know, Dory, that there, there'll be a lot of listeners to this uh, in our audience who are thinking, wow, I love this guy. Uh, where can I learn more about him uh, and read what he's written and where he'll be speaking? How do we answer that, Dory? Well, uh, I write uh, very regularly for American Spectator, for Daily Caller. Um, Foxnews.com runs me from time to time. I'm on air about uh, three times a week, two, three times a week usually, on either Fox News uh, Channel and or Fox Business Network. Uh, I'm often on Cudlow, Varney, a show called The Bottom Line, which is six o'clock Eastern time on Fox Business Network. Um, there's no regular schedule with us. We, we, they call us and say, hey, are you free? And if we're free, we pop up. If we're not, we don't. So it's a little bit unpredictable, but uh, you know, the more Fox News and Fox Business Network you watch, the likelier it is you'll see me. And if you don't see me, hopefully you'll learn something interesting and enjoy <laughs> well, what you I, see. There have uh, been many times I know when I've been watching TV with somebody and you're image pops up and I, I say, I know that guy. I know that so, guy, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and then uh, certainly you can Google me and I, I write uh, two, three pieces a week usually. And uh, uh, <laughs> people ask me where I get my ideas. I tell people, well, I just get up in the morning, turn the TV on, it's all right there. <laughs> I thought you got them all from fee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, some from fee, but a lot of the current events, you know, people say, uh, do you ever run out of ideas? I, say, I tell them, no, no, I just get up in the morning, see what the President of the United States is doing. <laughs> that almost, almost automatically gives me something to write. <laughs> DeRoy Murdoch, great friend, not only a friend of mine, but a great friend of Liberty. Uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this interview today and for all the great work that you've done and continue to do for freedom and free markets here and around the world. It's, a, it's a huge pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, DeRoy.